Hey, welcome to another episode of Stoop Stories. We're extremely excited because today we have a special guest in the studio. And I'll start by saying this. Winners win and losers lose. But the good thing is you get to choose. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, Dr. Seuss. Seuss? Mike. Yeah, man. Mike. So, hey, we've got Mr. Winner in the uh, in the studio, Mr. Andy Majors, a uh, recent inductee to the Hall of Fame of Pitt State University. So, Nathan, can we get a round of applause effect here? Um, <laughs> Josh, what are we going to be talking about here? With yeah, Andy so, so in order to be uh, at Andy's level uh, in college football, you have to be a winner, right? They don't induct people who lose into the Hall of Fame, safe to say. And then uh, I would also transition that into say, you know, Andy's career here at Southwind has been a lot of the same kind of things that have happened at Pitt State. He wins at a high level, he's a great leader, and he's having a ton of success. And what we want to do here is take a deep dive into the mind of Andy and what creates his winning mindset and uh, you know how he looks at life and how he finds a way to win even when the cards are stacked against him. So welcome, Andy. Appreciate you being here, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So let's start off by asking you this question. You know, you've done a fair amount of winning in your life. Is that safe to say? Yes. How do you approach each day to ensure that's the outcome that you achieve? Yeah, well, first off, I appreciate you guys having me on this podcast. I listen to all of them. I know that a lot of people outside of Southwind listen to this podcast, super impactful. So hopefully I can provide a little depth today to somebody outside listening in. So how I approach every single day, uh, it's with a relentless attitude. You know, I, I try to pride myself that I can control my, um, my attitude, my emotions, you know, whether it's going to be heightened or if I'm going to be down, I can quickly get out of that. You know, I, I think when people um, say things about me, like, you know, what's Andy like? You know, I like, to, I like to think people say he's consistent, his approach is um, well thought out, you know, he's relentless in what he does, and, you know, he's, you know, a good human being, you know. Yeah. But honestly, I mean, that's the approach I take every single day. That's what I try to impart in my son every single day is that, you know, whether you, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you know, some people obviously can have a brand new day, go forward, not even think about what happened the day before, where I think the special people, you know, think about how they got there. You know, I, I, I like to think, you know, a little bit about the day before, okay, what it took to win that day. If we lost, okay, what did it, what happened to where we didn't win that day? And how can we impact it, you know, uh, moving forward? And I just think back to when I played, that was something that we did consistently at Pittsburgh State, you know, a perennial powerhouse. Now, granted, we had a week in between to kind of prep and made it a little easier. Here it's a little different because it's every day, damn yeah. day, you know. Uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, if you're, even if you're not playing a, a game, you're still consistent in that approach. And, you know, I didn't learn that when I went to college, obviously. You know, um, I was obviously building my momentum until I got to college and it heightened there. And obviously it has permeated uh, into a new status now, being in the Hall of Fame with those people and obviously now into this business with Southland. Yeah, so you, you've said a, you said a lot of really good stuff there. And one thing that sticks out in my mind is the consistency. Uh, I, said, I said this um, today in a, in a meeting and I, and I, really, I really think that uh, it kind of frames how I think and it's uh you know talent talent people talented people well how about this all successful people are talented yeah. but all not not all talented people are successful yeah. and then I think about what it takes to be successful uh when you're talented and it's consistency okay and so when you say hey I wake up and I, I want people to think about me as a consistent person you know tell me about times when you wake up and you don't feel good how do you how do you become consistent then? Because shit, you're here. I get here at six, and you're here before me. I have no idea what time you're getting here, and you're doing the exact same thing every time I walk in. You're updating the whiteboards and the statistics on, on the board uh, every day, and so some days aren't good days. That I know you're not perfect. How do you get yourself in gear when it's when you're not feeling 100 percent? Yeah, I mean, you're either consistently bad at something or consistently good at something, you know, and I think that's how you create a behavior. And if I ever get into a situation where uh, I feel myself in that funk or, you know, I'm letting something from the outside affect me, you know, I try to quickly replace it with something positive. I will look at 
uh, a positive metric. I will look at a positive picture in my phone. I will listen to something positive. You know, this morning, for instance, uh, it was a good morning to start with. Did the same thing I do every morning as far as get, getting ready to prep. But something just didn't feel right before a meeting, you know. And, you know, right away I got in the meeting 10 minutes early, popped on a motivational um, uh, YouTube video, you know, one for me, but also for our guys to come in and during while they're waiting, they're having something positive in their brain before we start, you know. So I think that was a sign of me not necessarily doing it for myself, but I'm, I'm kind of doing it for somebody else. Hey, you know, what if they need to pick me up? You know, so I'm kind of being, a, you know, taking a selfless approach there too. Like if I'm feeling this way, maybe, or something didn't go as planned, maybe somebody else, you know, is going through that. How can I, you know, fix that for them? And, you know, I think back, I, there was numerous times I did that as a player, you know, especially being as a quarterback and a leader, you have to, you can't just look out for yourself. You're not, you're, you're not a wide receiver, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not sure. one of those guys away from the ball, sure you know, <laughs> but, it's, but it's a different approach, you know, and I think, you know, that, that can become a consistent approach is, you know, all right, how quickly can I get rid of this thing that can maybe can bog me down? Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I want to make sure we capture another thing that you said. You said that I believe that I'm in control, and then you started naming a bunch of things that you know you're in control of. And that leads me to your recent comment about success and talent. Yes. Which brings us directly to what I firmly believe, which is the who is more important than the what. Life is all about personnel. And if you have the right who in place, what it is they're supposed to do won't matter. Because if they're consistently consistent, mm -hmm. if they wake up on the wrong side of the bed but believe they're in control of the outcome, so start feeding their mind positively, positivity, what they're trying to accomplish that day, doesn't matter what it is. They're going to accomplish it. Yeah. You know, so personnel is key. Majors, tell us what is your approach to ensuring that personnel is always right. We've got the right people in the right seats on your team here in business at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And then also tell us a little bit about the personnel of your um, of your maybe your senior junior year football team at Pitt State some some personnel you know uh, things there that helped you achieve success and maybe some relationships that were built off that personnel. yeah I mean I think you know when you're talking personnel you got to you got you have to have a keen eye for it not everybody has a keen eye to recognize who's good and who's not you know I think I have a keen eye for it but I've still made the wrong decision of trying to put somebody in the right right spot but you know teaching and raising somebody up is all about trying to take someone, you know, to a level that they can't take themselves. And, you know, I think by doing that here in Southwind, the experience I've had in the year and a half I've been here, you know, it's giving those guys just a chance, you know, and sometimes, you know, they fail forward, you know, sometimes they might fail backwards too, but that's where, you know, I'm there to catch them and help them grow. And then, you know, before you know it, you have somebody in the right seat because, you know, they feel that, you know what, I got majors on my back or I got, JD or LeDrew or Josh behind my back, you know, um, just because, you know, I can't just sit there and guess like, oh, he might be good at that and then never give him an opportunity. Um, we've had success doing that here, you know, so far. Um, hopefully that continues, obviously. But yeah, I mean, if, if we don't have the right people in the right seat, you know, we're, you know, slowly, you're probably not going to see a, 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 an immediate reaction to that, but slowly you're going to see something, you know, or an outcome you're not prepared for, or an outcome you don't want. You know, and then you want me to talk about junior, senior yeah, year a well, little bit? Well, well, tell me this. What's the best personnel you had in your time at Pitt State, and what made it the best? Best personnel? Man, you want, like, football talk here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, like, why? Why? What was you the know, best personnel? <clears throat> groupings, that we were talking about. Personnel grouping out there. Well, you know, yeah, just you, you ran the, the players offense. players on your yeah, team. Yeah, you ran the offense. Who made life efficient for you? Yeah. What year was that in your career? And what was it about the dynamic I gotcha. of that group? Yeah, yeah. So, 04, 2004 is my junior year. And, you know, statistically saying we were arguably the greatest offense in the history of college football. And those stats are still out there. We scored more points than any other team ever. We averaged more yards than anybody ever, averaged more points than anybody ever, and scored more touchdowns than any other program ever. Any level, okay? And, you know, that was just – we didn't know that, obviously, going through the season. That's really impressive, by the way. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> that's, yeah, and ever those, is a lot. Yeah. It is. You know, <laughs> a long a time. And, you know, obviously we didn't follow those stats throughout the year because we were just winning games and just getting ready for the next week, obviously. But that, that year was so special because – there were, you know, the seniors in that part of that class in my junior year, 
they've been together for four years. There was a continuity to that. There was a lot of belief, you know, and us as juniors, we're still upperclassmen, but like we were part of that. You know, we, you know, we won some championships when we were freshmen and sophomores, so we had a taste of success, you know, even though we weren't like the catalyst of the team. But the, the cool thing about Pittsburgh State or any other championship program is like you're just part of that culture. You know, whether you're a freshman quarterback or a senior quarterback, you're doing the same damn thing that everybody else is doing. And, you know, so I talk about the belief. I mean, everybody just believed that, you know, we're the best team in the country. I don't care what anybody says. You know, if we're not number one to start the year, okay, well, we're going to be number one here pretty quickly. You know, um, just everybody had each other's back. You know, we had great, you know, in football, like you guys know this, man, there's so many different pools. You know, you got offensive line, receivers, running backs, you know, then you have the defense, you know, whatever. They're on the other side of the ball. <laughs> you know, I didn't say any defensive records are broken. <laughs> but what made our offense so special is like we were just like we were just connected. You know, like we had the right guys in the right seat. And the cool thing about it, guys, is you know we ran a two quarterback system. You know, like I could have easily played the entire every snap that you're a quarterback. Could we have had the same success? I don't think so. Could the other quarterback played every single snap and have the same numbers? I don't think so. You know, so we had the right guys in position. And, you know, there was certain parts of the game where our offense coordinator would be like, this is your drive, Andy. Or, you know what, Neil, this is your drive. This is, this is a, you know, this, we need a six-minute, 85-yard, 16-play drive. Neil, you're going in there. Or, hey, we need a minute and a half. Let's go six plays. Get it down there quick. Andy, you're going in there. You know, so coach, our, our offense coordinator knew that. And the cool thing about it is whenever I came in for a play, or Neil, our other quarterback, came in, there was never any doubt because the belief was so high. And I think that's what's cool about, you know, what we have going on here at Southwind is whoever leads a meeting, whoever runs operations, whoever's going to do this podcast, like, we all just believe that it's going to be dynamite. It's going to be good. I think that's what makes it special. Man, I'd love to unpack this uh, two-quarterback system yes. because, you know, that is rare that that ever works, yep. right? Uh, and the reason that it never works is because the ego – that that comes into play when you're when everybody wants to play all the time. Uh, you can't tell me that you didn't want every drive because I know you're a competitor and you felt like it was you could have done a great job. But being able to put that to s aside and let somebody else go in and lead the team, I think we got to talk about that. We do. What, what can I? I I'm I'm going to tell some you guys something about majors. So the listeners, I'm going to tell you something about majors that nobody knows except for me. Nobody knows. So I'm going to, yeah, he might be shaking in his boots. <laughs> All right, so get this. Andy Majors is actually a chef. Oh. He's a chef. Every morning he wakes up early, really early, because he gets here before everybody else. Yeah. He wakes up early and he bakes a humble pie. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, and he wakes up and he takes a slice, a slicer, and he, and he eats a, a piece of humble pie every day. Yeah. And if you ever need any, and do you, we want to check your ego and you want to learn what it takes to run a two quarterback system or approach life still to this day in a way that's humble and talk call andy majors today at 913 actually is it 785 email him at, at andy.majors at 1-800 you know contact him humble pie tell us yeah how, how did how were you able to accomplish that and what's the mindset that yeah i mean i'll, I'll be honest like you know that doesn't we weren't prepared for that, like day one of my junior year. Be like, hey, we're going two quarterback system. Like that was a build up from when I got to college. You know, I remember. You know, anybody who's an athlete, if you're a red shirt freshman coming in from high school, you know, you were at one point the guy, right? All of us here on this, on these, on these mics, were the dude in high school. And then you go to college, and all of a sudden, you're not the dude. You're a red shirt, and you got to pay your dues. And I remember making a comment to my father one day, like. Hey, I don't know. This is hard. I got to wait, and I got these quarterbacks in front of me. And he's like, "Where are you going to go? Anywhere you're going to transfer, you're going to be behind a quarterback." <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, "So it don't matter, you know." And he's like, "If you want to be there, then you need to be there, and you need to stick it out and make it worth it." And so, what, what was neat about it was, you know, Neil Philpot was the other quarterback. You know, we were different. He was six four, two fifty five. You know, I'm six one at that time. You know, one hundred eighty five. So we're completely different styles. And, you know, we used to run split back veer, hence 6'4", 255 is going to tote the rock more than me, <laughs> you know. But it got to a point like, okay, we have a guy here that can bring an element to the game that we haven't seen in a long time. You know, how are we going to get him on the field? 
and this, you know, this is a, a true, we just talked about right seat, right time mm -hmm. type of thing. So, you know, our coaches basically opened up the offense and, you know, it's, I think the humble pie comes more from a Neil Philpot because he was starting before me. And then all of a sudden he's like, I got to share reps with this guy, you know? And we had a great relationship. We lived two houses down from each other. Um, I didn't have a car until I was 21 years old. Um, I took my wife out on the first date, had to borrow a car. <laughs> so every day he picked me up, you know, and I think it just wow. started because, you know, cause he easily could have been like, no, he's my, he's a guy I might be splitting time with, or he's my backup. I'm not getting him there. So immediately I, I learned a lot of the humbleness from him because mm. he was open to be like, you know what, We're, if, he, if he makes the team better, bring him on. Because you know what, I get tired and I can't throw it as far as him. So, hey, he can help us out. Um, so, and I think just our friendship was good. Um, we never, we, on the road, on road trips, we stayed together, you know. So it was never a separation to where it could have caused anything. And, you know, honestly, um, we both were really, really good. I wouldn't change it for anything. Because people say, like, man, if you had that whole year by yourself, I'm like, I wouldn't want it. I don't know if we would have been as good. I guarantee we probably would have lost some more games, you know. And he probably would say the same thing. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, the, we, we, were, we were connected early. and We got it out front, and we just knew it was going to be the betterment of the team. Chef Mage. Yeah. I need a hat. Yeah, yeah we'll get you one. <laughs> Nate, Nate, can you work on that for us? Put a hat on him yeah. you know, on this YouTube video. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, really good, man. And uh, the humility that it takes to be a great leader, I think it really kind of sticks out when we talk about you, Andy. You know, you never have to be the guy. I, this guy does more one-on-ones than anybody in our business, and he doesn't do one, any one-on-ones. He, he has He's led his team in a way that his team – meets with each other to course correct and build the business and continue to develop each other, which is unique. Most guys, most leaders that I know, they like to lead every meeting and they like to do the one-on-ones because they want to be the ones that's calling all the shots. But you've done a great job of being able to remove yourself, you know, from from having to be the one that does everything, which may, actually makes you way more effective. You can get way more stuff done. So I, let's ask let's ask Andy another question. Uh, so did you know? Let's go back to football. Did you guys win the national championship that year? We did not. We made it to the national title. We were fourteen and zero going into the national title game, and we lost to Valdosta State. So what did that teach you about life? Because going into that game, you you named the stats earlier. Arguably the best offense in the history of the NCAA. And you go to Valdosta State and you take an L. And for a whole bunch of winners, that had to be traumatic. Yeah. Um, it told me we weren't good enough. I mean, honestly, I mean, you look at the records and all the numbers, and, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you where that trophy is, honestly, because to me it's – I don't want to see it. It's, it. it's a reminder. It's not – it doesn't tell me that we got national runner up. It tells me that we weren't good enough to be first, you know, and um, I've never watched the game. Um, I don't have anything to where I want to remember that because I just know we weren't good enough. And I can remember certain things that that we did or didn't do, you know, put us in position to win the game, you know, and um, even thinking even thinking back to the off season that that summer talking to my offense coordinator, you know, what did we miss out on? Where did we go wrong? You know, and there were so many what ifs. And it was just like, that's our problem. We're coming up with all this what ifs. Like, how about we just be better this summer and this fall? You know, so it, it, just, it taught me then, like, you know, when you're, when you're winning a lot, you know, you, ha you have blinders up. And we did. You know, we, we were so good. I mean, I mean, some of our coaches would be like, yeah, Wednesday, we're like, <laughs> we're going to win this weekend. So let's just start playing in for the playoffs. And you're yeah. like, it's week four, guys. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, but the coaches would probably say the same thing as we had blinders in us. There was things that we probably brushed over because our team was so good. And, you know, we took it for granted, you know. And I'm, I'm not taking anything away from Valdosta State. They, I mean, they were a really good team. And, you know, they came back on us and, you know, hit us in the mouth a little bit that we weren't ready for. And, you know, I mean, to give you an idea, like we gave up four sacks the entire season. We got, we got sacked five times in the national championship game. So there were some things we weren't prepared for, you know. Um, so, yeah, just it, it told us that, you know, even though you're breaking records and you're number one in the country, that um, sometimes that's not good enough. Yes, I love that. And so t today you wake up 
in the morning and you come to work, what are you thinking about and how do you ensure that you're good enough today? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in following a process. You know, uh, I know I'm consistent in my approach, you know, what, with what I have right now in Southwind. And if I try to veer off of that, it's only because, you know, something else became more pre you know, prevalent, you know, you know, something with our guys or something with the customer. But I know when I come in the morning, like, I have to be consistent because if I'm going to be a leader in this business, you know, the first thing is I got to be an example. And, you know, that's what I want to do for my guys. You know, I can, I can tell them things and talk about things a lot, which I do. But if I don't be the example of consistency and show them that no matter what, guys, I'm coming in with this approach, with this body language that shows that we're going to win today, then it doesn't matter. Because if I don't do that, they'll, they'll immediately call me out. Just like we would, one of our guys not doing the right thing, you know? They do the right thing for three straight weeks. They do one thing wrong. We're jumping them, right? Right. Yeah, it, it's the same thing for me, and I would, I would expect that from our guys to be like, Andy, you, like the other day, this is a great example. I didn't wear a blue shirt yesterday. <laughs> I didn't wear my blue 100 got jump polo shirt. That's a consistent approach that I've been really big on because, Josh, from day one, you said when you're in front of your team, I want you to wear branded stuff. And I would say 99% of the time I'm in branded yep. shirts. And you would have th you would have thought guys thought I was like, you know, an alien. Yeah. They're like, oh my god, I didn't even recognize you. I didn't. You didn't have your blue shirt on, Andy. You always have your blue on or something. And it kind of told me right there, like, I'm so consistent. Even the shirt I wear, guys just expect it one thing. Mm. Um, so I mean, that was that was kind of cool though too. Yeah. Um, but that was just an example that just popped in my head. I love that example. That was awesome. Well, close this out, Ledrew. Well, we're gonna close by this. You know, you create the life you live, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. And your life is created by your habits. So we're going to have Andy close this out by giving us his top three habits that creates the winner you're listening to today. <clears throat> top three habits. Well, I think the first one is, <clears throat> you know, I, I create a five minute maximum every single day that I have a chance to reflect. Now it helps that I have a 35 minute drive in and drive home every day, but I have a five minute opportunity to where I can reflect, uh, write, listen, you know, something that is gonna, as we like to talk about, be, be where your feet are. It gets, gives me a chance to ground my feet. That's something I've made a habit over the years. Uh, I think another big habit is replacing the negative with the positive. You know, I feel that you know, when a negative opportunity comes in my brain, I've consistently found ways to get rid of it as much as I possibly can. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. And that is not easy to do. And that's not something that you can just tell someone, hey, get rid of that idea. You have to be trained on it and do it over and over and over again. And I think the other one is, you know, it's probably hard to say that it's co uh, measurable, but I think it is. Like, a habit for me is just be coachable. Like, I think I'm one of the most coachable guys around because I'm, one, I'm open to coaching. Two, I was a coach for a long, long time, all right, and I know what it takes, you know, in 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 that uh, realm of being coachable. So I'm just those are the top three things that I do that just gets me in a position to where I can feel good about myself, and also just gets me in a position to people want to be around me. Yep. Well, uh, number four, eat overnight oats every day. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. That's it. That, that's all my wife. That might be the <laughs> humble pie. Yeah. That number we're four is about yeah. I eat very, very yeah. well. There you go. Well, the mic has been dropped. Andy Majors, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, guys.